Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching and thanks to our producer, Jeff Durall. Welcome to uh, the Fort Hayes State University Observatory atop uh, Albertson Hall on the campus of Fort Hayes State with a professor of physics, Dr. Paul Adams, who is also uh, with the Science and Math Institute and is one of the advisors of the Fort Hayes State Observatory. Uh, Paul, first of all, if you would, tell us uh, what's here. Well, uh, what we're up here is our, our observatory that was built in 1932. And it was put together at that time by the physics department because they wanted to do some research in astronomy. So what you find uh, around over top of us and on up that way for about another uh, 13 feet up there is about how far away it is, is a 10-inch refracting telescope that was constructed by the Lohman brothers and brought here to Hayes by, at that time, uh, Professor Gordon and Professor Zinzer, who were the physics professors at that time that wanted to get an astronomy program going. So this, this whole room is dedicated to this one instrument that we use up here. Now this is the 30s, so we're talking right. about early technology and early uh, uh, presentation at the university, right? That's, that's right, and it was, uh, I think it was good foresight at the time they wanted to get into astronomy because in 1930, where we're at now, well, it was just the prairie. Mm -hmm. There was no Coliseum, there were no wind towers, there was nothing out here and no lights. So it was a, a great dark space and also for construction, other than grain elevators, this was probably one of the highest spots on campus in the mm -hmm. 1930s. And um, they, they got this scope here to just try to uh, take advantage of that and get our students, since we were still a pretty young university, get them engaged in doing research. There was a kind of a tie-in, too, with Pittsburgh State University along yeah. that same line. Wasn't well, it? it's kind of interesting, and I have a letter here that, um, um, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned the history of this, and Dr. Morris Witten, who some people in your community may remember him, who passed on several years ago, but he uh, kept a history and kept the records. And uh, at that time, Dr. Gordon, who was a professor here, he wrote to Pittsburgh State, although it was actually Kansas State Teachers College at Pittsburgh, Kansas, <laughs> where they had purchased a Lohman telescope like this. And so this letter from December 26, 1928, um, says, my dear Dr. Gordon, I am indeed pleased to give you the information requested. We secured our instrument from Mr. E. Lohman of Greenville, Ohio. Um, he makes a good instrument, but is slow in delivering as his shape is not too large. And it just goes on to talking about their, a little bit about their telescope. And this is an actual original letter. Actual that was original written. letter from 1928, so I'm handling it very carefully here. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it's kind of interesting is that this scope, there's a very similar one at Pittsburgh State, and I was talking with a physics faculty member down there just this week, mm -hmm. and he said theirs is in a uh, warehouse right now. <laughs> But, but they've also moved up to some, um, with Greenbush Observatory, where they have a mm -hmm. professional grade uh, scope and they're able to do some research much larger. Now this scope is a 10 inch scope? 10 inch, and when I say 10 inch, even though I said it's 13 feet from here to there, <laughs> 10 inch refers to the uh, piece of glass or the lens that's at the front. Uh -huh. And we call it a refractor because refracting means to bend, so it takes mm -hmm. the light and bends it down to where we can get it focused here. And the reason we talk about scopes in terms of inches or meters or whatever unit mm -hmm. you want to choose is that what matters in a telescope isn't the advertised power. So mm -hmm. people are doing Christmas shopping, don't get sold mm -hmm. on the power. Mm -hmm. Look for the size of the objective or the front piece of either uh, glass or a mirror, which mm -hmm. would be a for reflecting telescope. And the mirror itself, or the glass itself, was actually imported from Germany. It was. It was uh, in looking through the correspondence we have that goes back. Um, the manufacturer, Mr. Lohman, talked about the f talked about first that they're German glass because mm -hmm. at that time in the 30s, you couldn't do better than German glass. They were excellent mm -hmm. manufacturers. But in the 1930s, and the correspondence about 1932, 34, 35, mm -hmm. said that he was probably going to get out of the telescope business because he couldn't bring in his uh, the glass and the lenses from Europe anymore because of the troubles going on in Europe, which. Mm -hmm. 
probably means they were switching from telescopes to wartime manufacturing in the 30s in Germany. So kind of an interesting, not only just an interesting piece for us, for astronomy, but it's even an interesting footnote in history about what's going on in the world. Well now, uh, describe the telescope for us if you would, Paul. Okay, well, uh, the telescope itself, at the front end way up there with these beautiful brass fixtures is a 10 inch piece of glass that's there. And then, the, as I said, the light goes down this dark and this tube is uh, comes down here. It's just a metal tube that comes down to some brass fixtures. And here we have some focusing knobs that come down to a diagonal that puts the light here for these uh, eyepieces. And we've uh, switched out of the old ones with modern eyepieces, but we, here's a, an example of an, a very much, uh, from the original time, an eyepiece that was used to that was used here. So that would fit in this uh, fit fixture right, here? Fit right there. Okay. But we've upgraded the optics because mm -hmm. we wanted to get better pictures. The front piece is still excellent to do it. Uh, that works well. Now the interesting things on the side though are the things that are attached to it to help you find things. One of them is this finder scope, which for most people, if they look at it, they say, that's bigger than what I have at home, which it is because when you get a big scope like this, start looking, you get so many stars that it's very hard unless you're very skilled and, and observes the sky a lot to pick things out mm -hmm. because the bigger the, the, the bigger the lens up front, the more light you get and the more stars you see. So mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing to look at. And then around over my head here to the side, this is a the right ascension. It's what's called a setting circle, but this is what is our, our way to drive through the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, when they had this set up here, they would set this up and they would uh, adjust this wheel and then tighten it down and they would know coordinates and, and it may be hard to see but there's very very fine machine etchings here that would tell them where things were east and west and then all the way up here is another wheel and again then there's this periscope type device that comes up here so you could read the etchings there that would allow you to line your scope up north and south and so you can imagine this room would be dark. Um, we have some red lights here now, but in the dark, somebody would be sitting back here, looking at this, looking at that, moving the scope around and getting it there. But then once you get it there, because the earth is rotating and if you look up at night, you know, you see the stars change. Well, the stars mm -hmm. change because of that. Well, the problem is the telescope, which is in this huge, heavy metal mount that's attached to the building mm -hmm. um, is going to go with the earth and so there's a clock drive here which there's a little motor which is about that big and this little gear that goes to a worm gear then over here is actually a drive wheel mm -hmm. so it will turn and it's the motor's rate is just right so that when we uh, lock it in on an object that we're going to be able to track that planet all night and all that. I remember back in the 80s when I was here we had some students and we took a car jack to lift this up and fix the scope because in the 80s it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so myself and some uh, students, we lifted it up, re-shimmed it, jacked it up, and then we stayed up here and sat down and spent the night saying, yep, it's tracking, yep, it's tracking. So, uh, and when I came back in the uh, 90s, then we put in a new motor and a new mount here mm -hmm. to do it because we've gone through a couple motors over time. But still, still a very usable telescope. Mm -hmm. but not up to modern standards. Must have been well built yeah. though for its time. It was. Uh, I, even though it was uh, done on a lowest bidder, uh, <laughs> which course. I have to say because the state had to appropriate this. This was, uh -huh. uh, it wasn't even out of the university's budget because at the time it was probably, its, it's bidding price is about $3,500 in mm -hmm. 1930. Mm -hmm. So you know, can inflate that as you will. But it was a state appropriation because you know the university budget wouldn't have been very large, mm -hmm. uh, maybe similar to what we hear these days. Maybe but, with, what, 150 students yeah, possibly. Yeah, 150 <laughs> students, but, but they invested in it, the uh, legislated or appropriated the money to buy it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the one thing that's kind of a humorous footnote is they were looking at reflecting telescopes, mm -hmm. which use a mirror, which would have been back here, and then a very mm -hmm. different setup in this room. But uh, uh, the legislature wanted to be conservative and go with the tried and true reflectors mm -hmm. instead of investing into those new, re uh, I'm sorry, tried and true refractors, mm -hmm. which we have, the, the, the new reflector technology. Of course, uh -huh. modern astronomy, that's all that is used as mm -hmm. a reflector because you can get more light uh, gathering for your money. So, but it's good. Talking about uh, the importance to students and the public uh, for an observatory like this, Paul. Yeah. Well, one of the things about this is that it shows in part 
um, the nature of science and how mm -hmm. if we want to find out about the world, we, we have to study, we have to observe. It's the information wasn't done in a textbook. And we go mm -hmm. back through the records. We find where students were finding out about variable stars, stars that would change their light brightness, mm -hmm. which are important in understanding our place in the universe, getting mm -hmm. a sense of how old it is, how far away the galaxies are, mm -hmm. and, and satisfying that curiosity. And you know, I've been teaching astronomy for a long time, and you know, you look back at the history of astronomy, at first it was one way to keep time. Mm -hmm. Then it was to say, oop, got to bring the crops in, because I see, I see that star in Virgo that's coming up. Mm -hmm. A spike has come up, uh, it means it's time to get ready for planning, or whatever uh -huh. it may have been, that was mm -hmm. the way to keep time. But people's curiosity just to understand our place in the universe is what still drives us a lot. And as we do it, we find out things, um, find out things about the solar system that we, we thought were true, weren't. Uh, mm -hmm. Studying comets uh, are important to understand the origin of life, mm -hmm. both within the universe, or studying you know, uh, whether it's the stars or the mm -hmm. galaxy. So all this answers a fundamental question of who we are and what we are in, in terms of the universe. So and those are big questions. That's through, true throughout the disciplines of science, whether that's it's right. ornithology or astronomy, isn't it? Right, and it, it's what I call curiosity-driven research. Ah. I just want to know. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and people do want to know. We have um, you know, the Astronomy Club, and Jack Maceberg, who's the co-advisor of that, mm -hmm. is that we do public programs, and mm -hmm. we do about one to two a semester. For, since we're getting mm -hmm. towards the end of our semester, we'll be starting again in the spring to look at some things, but mm -hmm. we have uh, a variety of people come up here just because they want to see and find out and look at Mars or look at Saturn mm -hmm. and see those rings. I mean, you can see pictures, but mm -hmm. there's nothing quite like seeing it for real and say, that's real. You know, that's really cool. Uh, Jeff got some great pictures earlier of the actual dome oh, itself yeah. opening, sure. which is still operable and usable. Yeah, the dome here, it's a uh, and this is what everybody sees. They say, oh, there must be something up there. They see the copper-clad dome, uh, and it is, uh, does have some ground arresters that you can see through the roof. But we have a shutter that opens, and as you open it, it sounds like something out of a Frankenstein movie. You know, you're going to raise it up, like you said, to get the lightning. And then the dome itself uh, is on rails, um, and so it will rotate all the way around. Uh -huh. The only time we ever have trouble is when we get ice in the winter, where we have to kind of tug on the chain. But you know that's that's a that's a minor problem. But as as good as this is, we also though as uh, as a university within the physics department, our astronomy program, is that we tend to use more now because this is not computer controlled and mm -hmm. it's not uh, talking with people who are experts in refurbishing. Said it's not really. Very, you can't adapt it at mm -hmm. all, or you really shouldn't spend your money on a bigger, better telescope. That's mm -hmm. always good. But we have an observation deck on top of Tamanacol where they do hold public observing times where the public can come up and use our other scopes. Because mm -hmm. though we have this 10 inch scope here, which is 13 feet long, we have another 10 inch scope, which is about this long. And it's because the technology changed. And so that's on Tamanacol. And if they go to the Fort Hayes uh, Physics Department, and look up the Astronomy Club, they'll be able to get the hours when that's open to the public all the time. This we save for special programs. I was going to ask you about the advances that have taken place, and now on uh, Tamanic Hall, these are, what, two scopes up there now? We have two scopes we use, an 8-inch, mm -hmm. which is from the 1970s, and a 10-inch that we got uh, about five years ago. But uh, even though that's a nice place to observe, we really need to be moving forward to building a, a my dream is to put an observatory off campus out towards, um, out on the university farm area, because mm -hmm. we have a 14-inch scope that we store in a shed and bring out when we do big programs, because we need a permanent place to build it. And so mm -hmm. um, it's the sort of thing I think would be of use to the community as, and school groups, as well as uh, the university students and just anybody that's interested in looking at the stars and so trying to been trying for years to raise the funds to do that so if anybody uh, wants to help us build an observatory <laughs> I'm certainly welcome to try to get try to move that forward but more. the university already owns the 14 inch scope. The university so. owns the 14 inch scope I um, acquired it from a friend at another university where they were retiring theirs and we now, took it. Can it be adapted to computer technology because you say that yeah. the, the computers have really advanced the science terrifically. And what's nice about this scope though the scope was built in the 1970s everything's mm -hmm. good and what we were able to do is we bought a 
mount, uh, which is how this is put up here, that is computer controlled. So in that case, the scope, it, and this scope is portable, we can put it onto new mounts, mm -hmm. and we already have the computer control. We just need a place and a building to keep it secure. We'll be looking at that in the future. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Paul Adams, Fort Hayes State University, professor of physics and our community connection. We'll continue with a little bit more from the Fort Hayes State University Observatory with Dr. Adams after this. Our community connection from Eagle Community Television involves area events and community people that we hope you'll meet, including from the President's Office at Fort Hayes State University, Dr. Mirta Martin. Well, thank you so very much for being here, and I look forward to welcoming you each month as we share with our community all the wonderful new beginnings that are taking place at Fort Hayes State University. Fort Hayes State University and others from our community connection. Thanks for watching Eagle Community Television. Welcome back to our Community Connection. Thanks again to our producer for putting together the program, Jeff DeRoll. We're with Dr. Paul Adams, Professor of Physics and Science and Math Institute at Fort Hayes State University and one of the two faculty advisors for the observation of the observatory at Fort Hayes State with students. Uh, Dr. Adams, let's start there if we could. What are the yeah. disciplines that are involved in learning process for students with the observatories here and the newer ones? Well, uh, one of the, of course, one of the, it's kind of an interesting thing is we have an astronomy club and the disciplines are every discipline. Um, I'd say my daughter who was one of the presidents of the astronomy club that she uh, is an English major and, mm -hmm. and even now she's taking her astronomy and I've read one of her stories from grad school and it was about astronomy mm -hmm. and learning the stars. So on our campus we, we try to make this all available to every major mm -hmm. um, and any student has an interest. So we have art majors who uh, like to come out and just get that appreciation of the, the beauty of the night sky and how do they translate that to other people as part mm -hmm. of that art. We've had um, um, again some geology majors uh, in the past that were really interested in this because mm -hmm. they liked meteors and mm -hmm. one of our presidents that would have been Susie Fishman several years ago she, you know, her, her thing was to go out all night and watch meteors and try to you know, get them when they would, you know, come to the ground as the meteorites mm -hmm. that would be out there. But so that was, uh, so that was an interesting piece was her mm -hmm. interest. And then of course we have the physics majors as well that uh, some of them do this as a hobby, but there have been a few that we get that go on. Like we had one student mm -hmm. last year, he was a CAMS student, mm -hmm. but he was very active in the astronomy club and he's gone on now to do his undergraduate work in astronomy as a result of this experience. So it's a kind of an interesting mix of students that are interested in astronomy. Let's go back, if we might, for just a moment to the computer-driven, newer technology right. of the telescopes and how the computer has helped advance the science. Well, and you know, this is really, and it really is something, is that, you know, I would talk about this 13-inch scope and how long it is, then I was saying, we have 10-inch scopes, this is a 10-inch, they're now about, you know, this big mm -hmm. and our 14 inches so big. Uh, part of that has to do with the computer that's dro that drives the development of the optical system. You know, mm -hmm. how do we put the right glass, the mirrors, the mm -hmm. lenses to uh, uh, maximize the amount of light that gets used for information? Because when we look at astronomy, which I always sound interesting, is all the light is coming for information mm -hmm. is from the light. But so we have, that's one part, designing. That's why mm -hmm. we can go with smaller scopes and put them on a deck. Mm -hmm. The other piece is that these uh, clock drives that are here are really fascinating how we can do it, but you know, the thing is that this is based on time, so it's something a computer can count and measure. Mm -hmm. And it's based on position and with modern GPS, and you know, in fact our telescope has a GPS unit on it so it can kind of locate itself in the world, which is kind of fun. Um, and uh, if you go out and buy these go-to scopes, you can do it. So one of the things about the computers is they can know, calculate and continually keep track of place and time, which is what astronomy is all about, is place and time, uh, a lot of it, about that part, about how to track. And what's nice is that it's opened up this whole market for any amateur now could go out and buy, uh, and of course, you get what you pay for. So you pay a lot of money, you're gonna get a better scope. Um, you know, if you think you're gonna get a deal for 50 bucks, probably not a great scope, but a lot of them now use what's called go-to technology. So once I orient its place in the sky by finding the North Star and another star, then mm -hmm. I can just push that scope. It'll say, go to here, and it'll have a little index. It'll tell you where to go. So for mm -hmm. amateurs or people who like to do it, it's opened up 
it's really been a revolution of astronomy where people can do it, particularly as you get a little extra money and say, I want to do this as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people tend to pick this back up again. They did it as a youth, mm -hmm. get busy in a career unless you're going to be an astronomer, and then they get back to it later in life and they can get the best toys. And, and computers have made it possible for people to do fantastic mm -hmm. things and have a lot of fun looking at the sky. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you, Paul, whether the, uh, the interest in the study of the solar system and astronomy in general has been increasing, decreasing, or remained about the same. It's kind of a period type thing, isn't it's it? It's kind of a period thing. You know, up here, we, we, you know, between here and the deck, when Jack Maceberg, myself, and the Astronomy Club members put on programs, well, we get a lot of people coming in. Um, a lot of little kids come up and they see the moon through the telescope the first time and it captures them. It's exciting, you know, science is really cool and they do that. And then as people get, it tends to get into their careers, they tend to give it up because astronomy does mean you gotta go out at night, you gotta get away from the TV, you gotta do some things. And so uh, I've been looking at, you know, there's patterns of people. So uh, younger folks are really big into astronomy and it's a hook to bring into other sciences because mm -hmm. There's so much to do and see and exciting. And then people get to get into their careers, not as much, and then do it as, old, as they get older and want to pick up some new hobbies, they can do it. So we're seeing a, a lot of interest on either end of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's kind of state study. I don't think it's really going down. It's a matter of people picking up. And then, of course, there are big spikes of interest in astronomy. Like this summer, we have. The first time we've got a, a the New Horizons mission is going to fly past Pluto. We should talk mm -hmm. about that another time, but that's going to happen this summer. And mm -hmm. interest in astronomy is going to raise again. We did a solar eclipse. We featured that. We had a lot of people come up to the deck to look at that mm -hmm. uh, partial solar eclipse. I see it kind of like your rocket launching because yeah. you have a lot of the little kids who really like to launch those right. rockets and maybe then it drifts off a little bit. But then as adults, we get uh, uh, back to some more uh, bigger and more expensive toys. And it's very much like that because I, I, we hear people saying, what should I buy for a telescope? And now as the Christmas mm -hmm. buying season is coming mm -hmm. up, I'll get uh, a lot of people saying, hey, how do I buy a good scope? And, and we'll give some advice on that. For anybody who wants to contact me, I'll mm -hmm. send out some links to do it. But, but you're very much right. It's mm -hmm. kind of a there. And there's those few that are passionate all the time, like any hobby. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a good hobby to get. Uh, talk briefly, because we mentioned this earlier, uh, Jeff uh, Durall, our producer, wants to see the rings of Saturn through a scope. Um, so you're kind of putting together something for late fall or late uh, spring? Uh, yeah, we're gonna go late spring. It's one of the things that we have to, we have to time our observance <laughs> to the movements of the heavens uh, you know, to do that. But uh, right now we're kind of in a uh, spot that uh, there aren't, uh, Mars kind of sets too early, mm -hmm. or too, it sets too soon for us to see it at night. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of in a, I want to say a dead zone is maybe not the best way, but right now the planet's positioned are such we can't see them. So we're going to be looking towards mm -hmm. late spring that will have Saturn again visible in our sky, mm -hmm. and then we'll do some programs with that because there's nothing quite like seeing Saturn through a telescope for yourself. Something else that we need to talk about in future programs on our community connection is the virtual planetarium. Right. What uh, and that's that's a, it's a really great thing that we had a donor make to Fort Hay State University mm -hmm. and uh, made the donation with the promise that we would get it out to the public and train people to borrow and use it like teacher groups and youth mm -hmm. groups. And what we have is a digital, it's called a digital planetarium. It's, uh, it, it's just a little box. You sit there, it has a computer and a big projector and an inflatable dome that goes about 10 feet up in the air. And you walk inside, it's, it's, uh, it's great, because we can take you to the North Pole, we can take you to the South Pole, we can go back in time, we can go forward in time, and we can look at what constellations look like for all the different cultures in the world. Okay, that's enough that's tease enough. now. That's enough tease, okay. <laughs> that's, that's enough tease. That's good, so, because uh, I want you to put on your professor's uh, cap yeah. now for a moment, and maybe even philosophy a little bit. Why do we study the sky? What, uh, what are we after? Curious and important and even the bigger question of space expert. Why yeah. are we always looking to the heavens? Paul? Well, you know, I, to, and this is my philosophy on this, is that um, it's, it's one of the first things that we go up at night we see something greater than ourselves. Because mm -hmm. you know, we see the sun crossed in the sky every day and people study that, but you go out at night and if you go out in a dark area, you can see you can see back in time. I mean, it, to me, what's neat is I look at the stars, I see a time machine. Because mm -hmm. the stars that get here, that light may have left 
you know, 10 years ago or 500 years ago, or we look at galaxies, we're talking millions of years ago. Mm. And it's looking back in time that we get a sense of where we came from, where our solar system came from, our galaxy, mm. and, and our, even our species, ourselves, mm -hmm. comes from. And so I think that's part of what drives it, is trying to understand that. And then there are other things like, you know, I, I believe we should be moving off this planet to other things, but to mm -hmm. do that, we have to study the stars, we yeah. need to study the planets. But it gives us a sense outside ourselves, an mm -hmm. appreciation of our place in the universe, and um, um, captures the mind and the imagination. And mm -hmm. you could talk about the practical sides, is that it sparks technology development. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got a lot of technology came out of the space age because we've mm -hmm. developed things, and communications, GPS, all this really has some roots within the astronomy. But at the end of the day, there's nothing cooler than looking up and seeing seeing the universe and, and to me knowing the stories that we've we've put in our culture in the sky and the innate curiosity of the human species it, and to learn that's right and that's what drives a lot of astronomers to do it it's just mm -hmm. i want to do it i have a friend who's a professional astrophysicist and you know his thing was studying just this one little group of stars and how they had this big outburst of things and trying to understand why did that happen and could it happen here you know it's kind of an interesting thing and the reason why this guy is such an effective instructor and professor in Forte State University's Department of Physics, always teaching and always helping us learn more. Our community connection from the Forte State University Observatory with Dr. Paul Adams. Thanks for watching.